we're going to talk about, uh, and then I'm not going to actually, uh, bunch of, I don't have any bunch of slides next day. This is a very heavy demo driven talk for the next, uh, one hour. So I, I have a few, like a couple. So I want to, uh, my mission, I want to make sure you are all superhero in Kubernetes native Java application, not microservices, not just microservices, not like a cloud network microservices. So my name is Daniel Rowe. I'm working for Red Hat as a developer advocate and then also CNCF ambassador, uh, to evangelize not only developer, but also SRE or platform engineer or full stack developer, any kind of IT folks, uh, talk about and uh, evangelize and uh, teach around the practice, the solution pattern, and around the cloud never runtime, like a Java, and also like a JavaScript, things like that. Here's my contact information, Daniel Rose with Zero, like a Twitter, YouTube channel, and then my GitHub, yeah, feel free, uh, follow me and subscribe me, etc. So, I just want to, uh, make sure everything, uh, everybody to understand. So people sometimes use, uh, these two terms interchangeably. Cloud native and Kubernetes native. So people say, yeah, my application cloud native app. Or sometimes my application Kubernetes native app. So, but that's not exactly the same thing. So cloud native is literally cloud, like uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Alibaba, IBM, or any kind of cloud provider. As long as, as long as your application running on cloud with the, uh, in terms of optimization, scalability, and electric, uh, elect, uh, elastic, and then a lot of things that resiliency. So as long as you have that kind of capability on your application running on cloud, you could say my application is cloud native. But you cannot say my application is Kubernetes native because cloud is not necessarily have Kubernetes. Of course, Amazon provided some SKS, like a EKS, and then, uh, and also, uh, Azure also provides the Kubernetes services like the AKS and the Google Cloud uh, Kubernetes services as well. So what is the difference between uh, cloud native and Kubernetes native? It's just like a Kubernetes and Linux container technology. So when you uh, develop your microservices application, .NET, uh, Java, Python, whatever you choose, and then you need to think about how to make my application more uh, fit in the Kubernetes. Because the Kubernetes provides a bunch of the capability and behavior. For example, you might remember that 12 factors, like uh, many years ago. So when you start develop your application as a microservices architecture, maybe you need to take a look at that. What is the 12 factor? So what kind of characteristic and behavior I need to uh, satisfy uh, as part of 12 factor, like a configuration and then like a uh, uh, like uh, some uh, deployment, and there are many kinds of stuff you need to fulfill. And then you could say, I have a microservices, a rather than client-server application in the back there. And then just like that, so in the back there, uh, like uh, for example, Spring Boot application, and then how to ex externalize your configuration out of your application, and then put it somewhere, like a Spring uh, uh, config server, or some any other configuration server or metadatabase or main cache server, things like that. So, because the best practice for uh, developing microservices, you need to externalize your configuration from application to outside because uh, the configuration may be relies on your, uh, some static value like IP address or some directory path on your local file system. So that will make your application more resilient and then uh, flexible, pretty much running on uh, across infrastructure, virtual machine, bare metal, even cloud environment. The same thing, Kubernetes provides like a service discovery, service resiliency, and then uh, replication, configuration, and the security. So there are many uh, functionality Kubernetes provides for developers. But you can actually um, don't use that, maybe you can use that. So there is no obligation. So you, you could, when you don't use that Kubernetes capability, you cannot say my application 100% Kubernetes native. 
So here's a, my last slide today. So this guy is you today. I don't want to talk about gender issues today, but this is just you as developer. And then after this session, I hopefully you guys are pretty much awesome, like a superhero, super developer. And then you're going to start your application development. And then you also need to think about how to make my application pretty much good at Kubernetes because Kubernetes provides many features. And then my issue in my Java program, how to use that Kubernetes resource? But I don't have enough time to uh, learn Kubernetes stuff because that's not a, a developer stuff. It's more like a op operation stuff, like a platform engineer or SRE, not my job. But things change that because many enterprise companies, yeah, you need to make sure and verify your application functions, capability, functionality have to uh, work in Kubernetes as well. So previously, you just verify your application on your local. That's it. And okay, my job, my job is done. And then just push the code. That's it. But whenever you, when sometimes the DevOps engineer or SRE team uh, using CI CD pipeline and then like uh, I go CD or get of action and then build application, deploy application into Kubernetes and you got some error because uh, you just uh, missed some kind of, uh, local thing. So that's why you need to make sure everything is okay on like a product delayed environment which is based on Linux container and Kubernetes. So today I'm going to use a focus to make your life easier and then uh, try to make your application more Kubernetes Way. So, interesting stuff. So, Quarkus actually released Quarkus 3 just last night. So, I'm going to use their brand new Quarkus version. And then, so Quarkus 3, uh, just a quick summary. Uh, Quarkus 3 uh, supports Dakar EE 10 and Microprofile 62. And then, it supports uh, virtual thread. It's uh, based on Project Boom. And then more uh, kernel programming and Linux. And then uh, support the microprofile 6 and hibernate uh, 6 and 6 2 as well. So I'm going to uh, try to use as much as possible in the process of each day. Okay. So uh, this is uh, my terminal. And then I'm going to make sure, I'm going to try to make a bigger, but uh, this is my best shot here. So let me try, you're going to use your, uh, there are several ways to uh, develop a Quarkus application at the very beginning from scratch. Maybe you can go to uh, Quarkus.io and then as you can see we have a new release, Quarkus 3 as a launch kit. And then here you just start coding which is the same way as pre-initializer. So you can go here and then uh, you can change whatever you need. For example, oh here's my group ID and artifact name and then I'm going to use Maven, Grad, or even Hotlin. And then I'm going to use uh, Java 17 or 11. This is what we support right now. If you still play with the Java 8, you cannot use the Quarkus. I'm so sorry about that. But you are behind like a decade. But, and then add some sample code here. And the, the most important thing is we have more than 600 dependent, uh, extension. You can say dependency in Maven project was a specific feature module on Gradle. Gradle and then uh, how to de how to develop a web application, and then also you can have many kind of stuff, uh, web application and the data transaction, cloud and the messaging. You could just select and then like uh, some uh, download the generate the application automatically, download the zip file and unzip and then, uh, open your uh, application project with your uh, ID tool like uh, IntelliJ or VS Code or even BI editor, whatever you want. You can also using Maven or rather command line to generate new project from scratch. And also I'm going to use a Quarkus DLI, which is, which is pretty much easier to uh, generate project and then uh, add a new extension, uh, things like that. I'm going to try to create uh, using Quarkus DLI trade. So let's try to create a new project like a Quarkus create a Kube native Java application. And then we have created a bunch of the uh, files, like a Maven wrapper. And then uh, configuration, in case I'm going to packaging application and deploy to a uh, Kubernetes Docker file, and then sample application here. So I'm going to change the directory uh, to Kubernetes. 
And then I'm going to open my application, uh, my ID. So, is it too dark? So, let me try to. Maybe I'm going to change that. It's the thing. Okay. Uh, maybe people. Okay. I think this is the thing. Better for you? Okay. And then the Supreme XML, uh, it's a, a brand new version here, uh, 3.01. Uh, uh, and then when you go to uh, application, you can see the sample application automatically generates like a uh, RESTful API, hello, and then return hello from SD, uh, EG Reactive, because the Quarkus was actually built on uh, Reactive Engine, which is uh, Netty and Perfect. That's why you can see uh, the reactive application automatically create. And then, um, that's it. And let me try to go back to terminal, and I'm going to run Quarkus, uh, Quarkus uh, dev demo. It's the library query. It's a totally different uh, feature, and uh, this is the beauty of the Quarkus. So when you run the Quarkus application uh, library query, and then you can see a uh, Quarkus application running, and then as you can see, uh, Dev profile activated, and then here we go, and then live query activated. What does that mean, actually? So, you know, before the starting, I'm going to open new terminal here, and then try to access the endpoint, just like a hello, and then as you can see, hello from message reactive, which is cool. And then I'm going to try to go to dev UI. It's the, another good thing of the purpose. So Quarkus actually provides two different uh, interface for developer. One is the terminal, like a CLI, and the other one is the GUI, the graphical UI. So if you prefer more graphical UI, you can get here, and then here's what kind of extension I already include in my Java project, like uh, some reactive or the other thing. And the configuration is to showcase all configuration you uh, define your application side, but also in platform layer, a framework layer, and one of the interesting here is the continuous testing. Everybody really uh, interested in test-driven development. It's a really important target because it uh, increases your code qualify uh, regardless of the code review. But it's really not fun stuff. So I've been done there more than uh, 20 years for code review stuff. But whenever I develop new business logic, I always need to add a new test case to my application. It's not for fun. And then sometimes the developers say, my application is super cool, perfect. There is no error. I guarantee 100%. But you can't be sure. Because it's a, and sometimes you got to just push the code, and then you can say, oh, my application is 100% sure, and the function is working. And then you just push the code, and then you go home. In the middle of the night, your some uh, colleague SRE just uh, push the uh, packaging app and deploy uh, the production uh, based on fantastic CI city. And then you got some error. And then some made a phone call to you just before midnight. Hey, then we got some problem. So you need to fix the problem right now because we got some error for end user. And you could say that's not possible. My my application is possible. So you got some you got some mistakes, so you need to fix that. So that's why that's the reason why developer and operation always have some arguments. So if you could have some testing capability, uh, just just automatically testing whenever you change the code, that would be awesome. You don't need to add uh, some uh, testing um, third party library on your uh, Java project. It's another problem because which tool I need to use that. Sometimes you edit, edit some bad tools, but you need to keep updating that tool based on your application. So I'm going to start from here, or you can start from here. If I press R, it automatically releases testing. Let me start it from here. And then it automatically starts application, and green means it's, a my, it's actually a test case, a greeting is testing. test. What does that mean? When I go back to my application, and here is my test directory, is the answer test from rest is reactive exactly the same result my actual rest for API. So that's why I show green and expect the terminal you can see green here. 
Green means everybody happy, not hope in Avenger. It's a green to happen. So, and the red means to fail, everybody angry. So let me try to go back to my application. And then my actual application is boring, and let me try to add, uh, what do I say? Like a, I say, right? Right? And then, uh, and then three. Okay, I just save the file. And then back to the terminal, and then you literally got some error here. And then you can say, Oh, hello from message VS. That is my expectation. However, you actually return Namaste is 2023. But when you go to another terminal and the inbox to let's say try, and then I, I got a new return code. This is really live tooling, just like a Java. I didn't even recompile my application. I just changed my code. And then save a file. And then I got some new error based on continuous testing. As well as, but I gotta see uh, my expected result. So that's maybe human error happening there. Okay, I just literally uh, satisfy result because I got some uh, expecting my result here. Namaste. However, my test case failed. But this is a very simple example. But just imagine that, okay, if you just missing your test case and then uh, you got maybe some unexpected error in your product. But Quarkus actually provided that kind of thing. You don't need to some press button like a run test your IntelliJ or VS code. So Quarkus automatically show that your test result. That is the real thing. Continue testing. If you go back to uh, GUI, you can also say here the same leader. So if you prefer GUI, you can go here. If you uh, prefer uh, Sierra, you can go there. Okay. So now I'm going to try to fix my problem. Uh, just copy the edge of result, and then back to here, and then, and then I'm going to paste it here, and then back to the green. Now I just go back to green. It's a, a my test case task. So some people ask me, hey Dan, you just change one single line of the application, Java. And then if I just wanted to add a new method, or I'm going to create a new class, is that still working? Sure, 100%. Let me show you that, uh, because the, it's a real live coding Session. So let me try to create a new uh, new REST for API based on test-driven practice. Let me try to create a new test case for uh, like a new API. We got hello greeting. And then let's try to welcome to to maybe Java with purpose. I just save a file and I'm back to the UI and now I got the new API just regularly got an error. So what is error? 404 error. I just edit the test case, but I don't have any resources, actual REST API. That's why I don't have, I cannot find my resources for all four error. Okay, still smart. And then back to the application, let's try to create a real application, REST for API. Try to new path here. You can see here, like I said, there's, an, there's a no Java app. So Jakar E E ten. This is a change that a uh, package name. And then let's try to reading and then new method. And then right to here. I come to maybe stop out with. And I'm gonna to try to add some parameter rather than just how the code. So it will be a uh, example. And then that property actually coming from my local file system. Let's say here, this variable. Okay, there we go. And then I just go back to here, and I got some another error here. Oh, fail to start process. And then try to go down a little bit more. And here we go. So we got a new error. So fail to load the config value at the value. So we literally showcase the right uh, error message. And back to my project, okay, let me try to add that resource to my application properly. Go to just like a corpus and a save a file. And back to here, I just pass my two tests. This is a really continuous testing. And then of course, and then back to the terminal. And then try to 
at this endpoint. Now I got to welcome to Q maybe double the process. So this is really where maybe you could say, oh, this is not related to Kubernetes. So why you try to show this one? Because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the developer job a little bit extended to out of loop, like a containerized application, as well as the verify your application on top of the Kubernetes. How to do that? You need to deploy your application to Kubernetes as well, uh, using like a kube portal and the writing YAML file for Kubernetes resources. So you need to spend more time to do that as a part of your daily job. So if you could save your time on your inaudible processes, just like this feature with the purpose, and then you can uh, have it to uh, work more time with the uh, out of the process uh, as a part of the optimizing your application as for Kubernetes native job. So I'm going to stop my uh, demo, and then I'm going to try to uh, just package this application like a job file. As well as uh, you already think about how to optimize my application, Java application. So that's the purpose actually provide the native compilation. So Java application running on JVM traditionally using uh, JIT compilation like just in time. However, you can also package your Java application as a native executable file like a Spring native. But purpose actually provides that functionality uh, at the very beginning uh, purpose design. So the so purpose provides a native executable for developer to make that packaging. And then running on Gradient. And then once you're packaging a uh, Java application as a native executable and deploy Kubernetes, in the end, you save a lot of resources on top of Kubernetes. That is another way to make your application more Kubernetes way. So let me try to uh, build my application. Build. And then you can use like a Maven clean package or uh, graduate stuff as well. And then luckily, I just uh, using continuous testing. That's why I test uh, run to all, uh, uh, no failure. And then now I just finish my application. And then I'm going to try to run my application like uh, some, uh, uh, jar command line here. But for that, let me try, uh, my activity monitor. So, okay. So I already run many JVM. I'm sorry about that. So here's I highlighted so all my JVM right now. And then back to my application, I'm going to run. And now you can see, I just start my application less than half a second. So when I try to run this application with the screen boot 3, and then it actually 1.2 seconds. So this is really, uh, you, just, you don't have any, give some effort, but you got some already optimized Java application. I'm running on Kubernetes. And then 3 point, uh, just 0.3 seconds. And then now we have a, a new uh, JVM just start up, like a 88 uh, megabytes of memory footprint. Just remember this number. And then I got just run uh, my application uh, functionality checking. And I got the same result. And then it's literally uh, increased memory footprint from 8080 to 90. So, and then back to the uh, terminal. And then I'm going to try to uh, package my application one more time as a native. And then just try to compare how much memory resources that you can save and also how fast your application starts. So I'm not going to say you're going to always to have native executable, but sometimes your application should be, can be scaled out more than thousand or even million. At a time, you also need to think about App optimization and scalability on your application stuff. In that case, you're going to uh, choose a native execution, uh, executable, uh, file. And then also, uh, you're going to uh, think about event-driven application or sub-arrest. It's a pretty much the, uh, small memory footprint in the fast start of time. It's a pretty much the good choice for you, uh, you uh, your uh, application optimization. Okay, now I'm going to have a new executable file here, uh, just uh, 41 megabyte is file size. It's uh, pretty much smaller than any other uh, Java framework uh, using uh, native executable uh, compilation. And then, let me try to run this application. I don't need to use the Java command line, and then as you can see, I have only 21 milliseconds to start off. 
Previously, remember that it's uh, like a 0.36 seconds. It's almost like a 12 or 13 uh, fast start of time. And also, when I go to uh, activity monitor, now you can see 13 megabytes. So previously, 88. It's uh, like a uh, 7 uh, less than memory footprint. And then when I go to uh, another terminal, make sure my application is still working. I got the same result, and now it's just when uh, one memory uh, footprint just uh, uh, increase. So uh, this is another way to make your application more Kubernetes native with a memory footprint and a fast start of time. So let me go to application and stop it. So this is just still just really uh, restful API. So what about the more realistic application use cases? So let me try to add a few more fun stuff here, uh, like a Let's say the data transaction. So, for example, my application connects to database on Kubernetes. And then, how do you develop uh, your crowd uh, business application on your local machine? Maybe there are several ways. Okay, I'm going to install my, let's say, I'm going to use PostSQL. I'm going to install PostSQL client on my local machine, desktop, laptop. Or, uh, I'm going to just connect to some test database. Or, I'm going to try to, uh, Pull container image and running on my local machine. There are many ways, but whatever you choose which way, you need to do something. Configuration, download, and then install, and read the uh, guidebook, and then run using some various command lines, Docker CLI, or Docker Compose, or some post default command line, things like that. The purpose actually provides the dev services to like a more uh, high quality testing as well as uh, pre verify your application uh, functionality before you actually deploy the Kubernetes with the same technology set. So let me try to add, uh, like a some, uh, database like a JDC Postgre database in Hibernate ORM or not. And the uh, less easy checks uh, is to consume and produce JSON file format. And, and then once again, I'm going to try to run uh, talk demo again, uh, back to my, uh, inaudible process. I got some error right away, uh, because the, when I go up, it's a pretty big, okay, I got some find the error. So I just started my application as a React mode, and now you just edit a, like a, just a non-reactive application, because I'm not gonna use a reactive database. Just a traditional, like a relational database. That's why there's some conflict error here. So let me try to fix the problem back in my project. And then, let me go to PromiseML. It's pretty easy to change that. I'm not going to use the reactive and save a file. And then back to the terminal. It's literally, and then you can see, automatically container just being start up. And then, we go to, let me try to show that. Let me try to uh, clean up first. Here's my uh, running container post before. So let me try to kill that. And then I don't have any running process. And then we'll run first step. And then you can see automatically a uh, container post before automatically start up. This is a first step, uh, the dev services. And now you can see the post before automatically start up. However, when I go back to my uh, project, you cannot see any kind of PostSQL or test container uh, dependency or configuration. Even if uh, when I go back to the application properly, there's no uh, database uh, related configuration here. So let's go back to uh, dev UI. And then here is the uh, dev service menu. And then let me try to Reload. And then now you can see here, there are a bunch of the configuration. What is my JDBC URL? And then, what is my username and password? So you actually set up this configuration to access the database. Uh, not only container database or some physical database. So this is one of the uh, jobs for developer. But the purpose dev service actually just uh, reduce that job. And then automatically start up. When you stop, your purpose demo, this running process, the container process automatically is terminated. 
So this is another uh, good thing, save your time for as a part of the interval process, and then also make sure your application functionality working. Uh, with the same technology stack, just like a Kubernetes. And then let me go back to my project. Let me try to add some things here. Uh, this will be, uh, will be maybe a little bit faster. Like some here is Java, uh, so the entity. Let me try to add an entity here. And I'm going to use the hashable, make it better. And then if you are uh, just a, you are having some experience screen boot, and then how to develop data transaction. You're going to use a Spring JPA, and then you're going to add like some entity uh, class, and then like a mapping class based on like a SQL mapping, things like that. And then you're going to add some SQL file, uh, like a create a table schema, and insert uh, like some data as well. And then the purpose actually pretty much be provide a similar way, but using Hibernate ORM based on uh, integration Hibernate ORM and then on. So let me try to extend that Panache Entity. So what is the Panache Entity? So when you go to Panache Entity, is the Panache Entity actually uh, extends Panache Entity base. So whenever you develop new database, uh, like a transaction loaded, like a prod, and then you have to implement like a fundamental operation, for example, save data, and then delete data, insert data, and the Retrieve data, like find by ID, find all data, all fundamental you need to implement. Also, the, the Java doing mapping using get, etc. So, Panache auto automatically implement and extract this step. And the purpose is just to use that. So, as a developer, you don't need to do, you don't need to do that kind of thing just like you did in Spring Boot. You don't need to do that anymore. It's another thing, save your time for internal process and spend a little bit more time in the outer loop. Uh, for Kubernetes native development. And let me try to uh, add a few uh, here, like some expression of the public. And then another thing, this address, that's it. That's all I needed for entity, uh, just Java Bean. And then go back to resources. And let me try to a few less for API. I want this, I don't want to, uh, use the plane. Let me try to return that to JSON. And then new endpoint like a person. And then I'm going to try to return to our wish. Here we go, uh, Java. About you feel? Then let's go to person. The uh, input automatically, and then let's say uh, the method name like a uh, find all, and then let's try to person and with all. So. This is another the fundamental operation you just use from uh, Panos. And then the list. Yeah, we got a some wrong input here. Just right here, so that you feel. Okay. Okay, let me try to add one more SCU API just to retrieve the specific certain ID rather than all data here. So try to new ID and then just return one uh, person data. Uh, let's say let's go find the by ID and then parameter here. ID and then take a long side. ID and the person is also another the Panache, the fundamental uh, operation here. That's it. I just created two uh, RESTful API to retrieve the data from all data and then some specific data. 
uh, using a hybrid network and pronostic extension on Corpus. So now I'm going to try to do some uh, simple SQL file here. Or SQL. And then insert into, let's say, the table name person. And then go to ID1. And then name is my name Dan. And then I'm from uh, Boston, University of uh, United States. And then I'm going to add a few more data here. Like I said, Dan from New York City. Team from like San Francisco. All right. Just done. And then back to my terminal. And let me try to uh, access the endpoint once again. In the cook. So now I got to need, oh, yeah, please. Oh, just I need to update it to ID, not over ID. Let's see here. So now I got a three results. In the meantime, just literally, I got to keep using live query and then uh, the other stuff. If you go to like uh, some other thing, like uh, number three, it's the team from San Francisco. So now I just create to uh, keep using live query and then I'm 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 totally ready to uh, go to Kubernetes right now. So I'm going to stop my application and then I'm going to try to uh, uh, packaging uh, just that file and uh, deploy it to Kubernetes. And then how do you do that as a developer? You're going to like, create a Docker file. Uh, first of all, you're going to create a Docker file, packaging app, and then like, a containerize using doc, a Docker file, and then like, a Docker command line. And also, uh, once you containerize the application and push it into some container registry, like a Docker Hub, Quay.io, Google Container Registry. And then after that, you can create a YAML file, like a Kubernetes manifesto. And then you can run that YAML file, you're targeting Kubernetes using kubectl. So there are several steps the developer needs to uh, uh, verify your application on top of the Kubernetes. So, so Quarkus actually provides some uh, great feature like a Kubernetes and OpenStack extension, uh, make it super easier. Uh, they kind of job. So let me try to add OpenShift extension and Kubernetes configuration. In the end, I'm going to uh, explain why I need to use Kubernetes config extension. And then, uh, let me try to go back to here, uh, my project, and then application. So now I'm going to try to set up the real database configuration because I'm not going to use dev services like a test container anymore because that was my local. And now I'm going to produce application Kubernetes, which means that is there somewhere Kubernetes that are already running PostSQL database. So that's why I need to uh, set up my PostSQL database. Let's say the database of the schema and the name is person. I'm going to try to drop and create a new data. And here, this is that anymore. And then import Ibanez Pro, let's say two. And also load the script file because we already created SQL file. That's it. This is all my uh, post SQL uh, configuration. And now I'm going to try to Kubernetes uh, configuration here because I'm going to deploy Kubernetes, uh, my application Kubernetes. So, Kubernetes deploy, which is true. And then, deploy my target. Here, you can say Kubernetes, like I just vanilla Kubernetes. I'm going to use open shift state. That's, that's why I open shift. And then, I'm going to try to expose the, uh, there we go. So, OpenShift cluster is based on Kubernetes. It's automatically set it up the uh, ingress controller based on HA proxy. So, when you deploy application to OpenShift, it automatically creates the, the a fully qualified uh, domain name, like a, like a www.danielo.com. So, that's why I'm going to try to, with this one uh, TN value configuration, uh, generate automatically the raw URL. And then on let's see how so yeah so and also open the cluster provide the TRS combination like HTTPS protocol 
So I'm going to set it out. Uh, I'm going to use that kind of thing. Okay. So let's try to uh, view my application once again. Save my time. I'm going to get the unit test. In the meantime, let me go to my, this is my OpenShift cluster. And then here is my namespace DOH and dev. There's nothing in there. So let me try to create a database. Here, uh, PostSQL. And then, write to PostSQL schema name, person, and then username, user, and then password, uh, for secret. And then once again, the person. And then just create a uh, database. And then back to the application, the same thing, user, for secret, same thing. And then this database just created. I'm going to change the label is to make sure, uh, this is, uh, container path is for SQL. So now it's supposed to call, you know, back to my application still. So now you can see I created a job file here, and then containerize the application based on OpenDate 17, and then using Docker file, things like that. Because when you generate a new purpose project, there are Docker directory automatically generated, and then it's already Docker file generated like for JVM and native compilation. So you don't need to create a Docker file, you don't need to use Docker CLI, like a Docker build, Docker that go wrong, things like that. Because the purpose automatically generates this kind of stuff for developer, and then just run the purpose data like a purpose build or a Maven clean package, and it automatically uses this Docker file and the containerized image and push it into like a, a push the cluster while uh, you define some container registry with your uh, credential. And then, and then, and then when you go to target directory, you could see Kubernetes directory automatically generated during the build application. And then there are some YAML or JSON file which he already generated uh, Kubernetes and open the resources. And then, uh, in the meantime, uh, once you complete your containerized application and run this YAML file using like a uh, Kubernetes API and then deploy the application to Kubernetes. So you just skip it, uh, writing Docker file, writing YAML file, and then run Docker CLI, run cube total CLI. Oh, we got a error. So maybe it's a network issue. So let me try to, uh, one more time. So sometimes I've got some issue for, uh, Wi-Fi internet because my cluster is actually running on, uh, United States in the Amazon cloud. So maybe sometimes there's some, uh, network issue in the, like a pipeline issue. So that's why I don't fail that. So what I want to do next thing is once I deploy this application, and I'm going to try to uh, to access the RESTful API once again to make sure uh, this application totally working just my just my local application. So and then what I'm going to do next thing is uh, to do is I'm going to try to uh, this application more Kubernetes native Java app. So I mentioned earlier, the Kubernetes provides some uh, bunch of the good uh, features. So for example, so externalize your configuration. So Kubernetes provides a Kubernetes config map. You can also save your sensitive information, like a, just like a, we're going to use a database username password on my local file system, like an application property. But that is not a good uh, practice. So that's why you need to externalize the data application store somewhere out there. Luckily, Kubernetes provides a secret, uh, like a secure application, secure, secure the, uh, property. So we're going to use that stuff. But developer challenge is, how do you access that Kubernetes resources from my application? Just like a key and value, like a, like a memory cache, uh, way. So I'm going to try to showcase that kind of thing as well. So in the meantime, let me try to create uh, first the secret using cube cuddle, just like the same username password. And then when I go back to uh, app, uh, my OpenShift cluster, you can actually find the, uh, just create the DB credential, and then you can reveal here, and then just like the username user, password is super secret. You can also create a complement from like OpenStreetCluster uh, web UI. 
if you prefer a GUID uh, interface, and then it tries to create a new config map here. Let's, let's say config map name is my config, and then the data my config name. Uh, my company name, like a Porter Suite. Okay. So previously, my application, and I go back to property, it's just a Porter. And I'm going to change to uh, this is Porter Suite. Okay, and I go back to Porter view. Yeah, hopefully, I just uh, deployed success. And now my application here. And then when you go to a uh, bureau, and then it automatically creates the data as you can see, and then the uh, the waste version uh, three one one, and then it's actually a production profile activated. There is no live coding anymore, just like a immutable container image. Now let's try to go back to upload view. And then you can find a uh, route URL. Let me try to copy this route URL. And then this window. And then now I'm going to try to, this is a real uh, Kubernetes environment, not my local. And then access that. Now, and I must say, this 2023. We will the same result I got in my local. And then try to do this. And then it's a welcome to Kubernetes Java with the purpose. Let's try to, uh, one more REST API is actually going to a uh, database, which is running on my PostSQL database on Kubernetes. So now I can say, oh, my application is fully working from my local and my Kubernetes environment. In the meantime, I'm going to use live coding, continue testing, um, more, my, uh, guarantee my quality of my code as well as I already verify my container environment on my local machine, which is making my application pretty much close to Kubernetes native Java app. But there's a more improvement point, just like uh, I already store my application on my local file system. So let me go back to application here, and then I'm going to try to enable config map and secret, which allows me my application to access that config map and secret rather than my local file system. In order to say, let me try to add to the Kubernetes config. Um, okay. Here we go. So Kubernetes config secret is db credentials. Just go back to yeah. And then let me try to and then uh C3 enable sure. This is allowed me my application access to uh, actually access to config map and C3 and then I'm gonna enable config map as well. And then config map name is my config. That's it. I just, just, uh, edit that. And then now I'm not, I don't need to, uh, set it up the static PN value on my local file set. You know, then I just enter send and the username, which is the key, and then password, password. That's it. And let me go to my restful API. And then the key name, my console name. That's it. So, and then I'm going to read you for my application and make sure my application is still working exactly the same way. But in this case, uh, my, this RESTful API actually go to referring to for, uh, spring, uh, Kubernetes config map. And then database sensitive information not looking at static value here is pretty much stored in the Kubernetes secret. And I'm going to add one more interesting here. Um, so sometimes you gotta uh, you just deploy application Kubernetes. However, maybe sometimes you gotta some error. 
And then how do you troubleshoot your application? You need to find some, some law first. But the, the beauty of the container and Kubernetes, Kubernetes actually got some problem, find out, just kill the path and the restore, just literally. And then some law inside the container is strong because the new container is totally brand new. And then that's why you got to add the business logic or logging logic. It's just sending out your logic into some local infrastructure somewhere, like a, some dynamic, uh, app dynamic, or CCD, or some Dynatrace the local infrastructure. But as an individual developer, it's not easy to uh, find out their logs from product of infrastructure. You might open the ticket and they're waiting for a couple of hours, and then you got to maybe, um, make a Maybe a 10 million, a 10 megabyte log file can download it. And it's not easy to find the relevant log right away. However, if you could replicate that log, that error right, uh, right away from your local to the remote Kubernetes cluster using live coding capability, it's pretty awesome. So that's why Cortex actually provides uh, remote dev, uh, uh, the functionality as well. So it's pretty much the, uh, help, uh, the developer, uh, keep making better application from local to Kubernetes environment. So in order to that, I'm going to try to add a few more configurations here. So packaging type. As you know, the container, we can say, uh, immutability. Because once you create a container, you cannot change the container. You can actually change that and in inside the container, but when you restart the container, it's gone. So that's why we can say container is immutable. But we need to do live encoding with the running container. That's why we're going to make a container is immutable. And then this is the password just between my local and the remote Kubernetes cluster. And then now URL, which is that. This is URL. The one more thing, infrastructure, focus, run C, and then demo in the running container. Okay, that looks good. And then back to the here. Let me try to deploy the one last time. And then once I deploy it, and then I'm going to try go back to my terminal, and then try to uh, in, uh, invoke the REST API to make sure my application is still working to access database based on Kubernetes secret, which is already stored by sensitive database credentials. And also, I'm going to call another API, which is referring to Kubernetes config man, which is a return Quarter three, not the focus just like my local environment. In the meantime, let me try to uh, revisit it uh, here, JVM, and then uh, there are why some people ask me why is there are some two different uh, Docker file, like a Docker file JVM, Docker file legacy jar. So focus framework actually uh, override uh, Java classroom. So we, which will make us to find out the class of paths and the relevant library location will be faster. So that's why for, when you when I start a purpose application as a jar, you can find that oh it's like a less than uh, half a second. Uh, this literally uh, we invented it a uh, cross order, and then we can say purpose job file is a faster jar, and then it literally uh, generate not right under target directory, it's under the target slash purpose dash app uh, directory. That's why you go to go a uh, Docker file JVM. You can see here the dot file directory target and under the uh, purpose dash app. But sometimes uh, you need to uh, locating your job file right on the target directory rather than a uh, two level. Because some platform only allow you uh, referring uh, this directory just right under the directory. In that case, when you're packaging a legacy jar, like a Uber jar, it automatically generated the, the job file location, which is just right under the target directory.
and also native uh, and native micro, we have a very small, tiny uh, base images rather than just normal. But there are some uh, like some tooling. It's uh, uh, not easy thing. It's a micro one. It's a pretty much focused on uh, fast startup time. Okay. So go to here. Let's see what's going on there. So it's actually uh, done, uh, should be done in the like uh, less than uh, 90, 90 seconds, but uh, it uh, depends on the network thing. So once I done, and I'm gonna try to make sure my application is still working, and I'm gonna run my Quarkus demo as a remote demo, which allows me to connect my local Quarkus environment into remote cluster. And I'm going to try to my application changing and modification, and it literally detected which file actually changing right now, and then Quarkus has detected that file, and then pick that up, and then uh, just sending to remote Kubernetes in a second. And then you try to access that, uh, running container pod using like a less wave card, you will find that, oh, my application just reloaded in the remote Kubernetes. So that's what I'm going to showcase on uh, last thing. I have a four minutes left. Okay, so it's still taking time. Let's see here. So let me, you know, meantime, let me try to let the revisit new port.io page. So just for fun. You can click on a uh, normal about port history. And then we just like I mentioned earlier, what kind of new feature focus we actually uh you have a question? Uh, the question was uh, when I'm containerizing my application, I just want to use my uh base image from my private registry. Yeah. So how do I get my uh image? So yeah, there's a configuration uh you can override the base image and then you can also uh the automatically then and Docker file. You can go to that Docker file, you can switch it to base image, like a from line, or you can override like a configuration, like a, what is my container based image. So there's a two different ways. So first of all, so you can literally, you can forcefully change this part, um, so your container based image, like some like a Docker hub or my container based image, you can change that in Docker file literally. Or when you go to application property file and there is a key and value. Like so container based image equal and your actual container image is the absolute path. So there are the two different ways you can override the base image when you containerize the application. Okay. And uh, if I want to secure my uh, uh, API, then uh, I want to create a load balance in front of it and uh, uh, make it uh, enable the SSL. Yeah. Uh, you mean the, the single sign on? Uh, no, oh no, SSL, uh, SPDB. Ah, SSL. Uh, that is uh, literally not perfect stuff. Because the, when you deploy application in the that platform or cloud, actually, they provide the internal of the network, like uh, some TLS combination, HTTP protocol. But the, the setting of this uh, trust TLS, is for only open source cluster because the when you ask the Quarkus application and then maybe if you there are some TLS combination in front of a Quarkus application, maybe you cannot reach out to Quarkus app directly. So that's why if you the true and then you allow for you access the Quarkus application through TLS combination, but it's not uh, make available TLS setting on your platform method. Let me go back to you. Oh. Yeah, I got a thing. Okay. Yeah, so, so, is it, and, yeah, okay, so we running all the time, so I'm gonna just finish my talk today, quick summarize. And then, so uh, this is all kind of stuff, I already just recording this is a demo, and then I got some uh, several uh, steps. And then I got some live coding stuff, and then uh, deploying, and the remote dev stuff. And then you can visit my uh, YouTube channel, like a video you are at Daniel TV, and you can find the dev demo, and then maybe you can uh, rewatch it, and then how it looks like. And then I actually wanted to showcase the last stuff for the remote dev, which is a pretty much easier to troubleshoot 
uh, your some error from your uh, container environment. So please make sure you're not going to try to connect from your local environment to actual product now because whenever you change the stuff, it actually applies to Kubernetes environment in product now in a second, maybe sometimes within the entire system. Thanks for attending today and enjoy the uh, rest of the day.